Hey everyone and welcome to the Hair Healer Podcast. I'm your host, Colleen the Hair Healer. I invite you to embark with me upon a journey of exchanging energy and creating conversations with my clients as we discuss our journeys through life. So come with me and let's see where today's episode takes us. Hey everyone, happy Monday. I hope everyone had a fabulous weekend. I can feel the energy start to shift and move. We're getting to the end of Mercury retrograde. I know for me, the salon was definitely a little bit easier this week than it had been previous weeks that you heard me talk about. Today, the moon is in the first quarter moon in the sign of Gemini. Okay, so a little bit lighter. The first quarter moon is a very positive time. This is a time coming off of our new moon, right? We set new moon uh, intentions. And right now, during this time, we're going to see how this is going to blossom. How is it going to grow? How is it going to blossom? This is a perfect time to take an action step towards your intentions that you manifested towards the new moon, okay? The moon is on your side in the first quarter moon. It wants you to grow, blossom. Remember, the moon is the mother. So the moon, the mother loves for her kids, right, our little soul babies, to get up and live life the way that you're supposed to live it. And how are we supposed to live that life? By following our dreams. Okay. The universe, the planets, the moon, it's always on our side. And even when it feels like it's not on our side, that's usually for some soul growth because also there are going to be hard times in life. That's just how it is, but it's important for our soul to grow in those times. Okay. Now, when the moon is in Gemini, do something that's coming from your subconscious, right? What's been coming up? What has been highlighting itself in your life and the ways that you need to grow? Now with Geminis, right, we are inquisitive. We want to know. A lot of times we can be a little bit invasive. So it's okay to ask those questions. If you need to ask someone a question and that's going to help you move ahead in life, act like a Gemini and we'll just ask because no matter what, 50% of the time you're going to get a yes. So many things I get in life, people say, how'd you get it? I just asked. It's really that simple. So that's a lesson we can take from Gemini and in the first quarter moon. And we're going to move ahead. Again, this week is going to be pretty positive, pretty happy. We're headed towards spring. And I know that we are all ready for that. So I am excited about this episode. As some of you know, this past Friday, I I ended up recording my own um, story about heroin addiction, which I was ready to finally put it out there on a public forum. That'll be out in a couple weeks. But a few weeks ago, I interviewed my longtime friend and client, Ken Orr. Ken has an amazing story. I met him when I first got clean from heroin in a meeting, and he is super positive, right? And as we know, positive people attract positive people. Negative people attract negative people. It's really, you know, obviously it's more confusing than that, but in general, it's pretty much that simple. So he was super positive. I instantly loved his energy. I loved his smile. I feel like him and I had this like smile off when we met, like who could smile bigger? And we became instant friends. Ken has an amazing story. He got totally clean at 48 years old after pretty much spending his entire life. I think we talk on this episode, he took his first drug at eight, his entire life partying like a rock star in South Philadelphia. All right, he was a wild man. And guess what? What I love about his story is it's never too late to start over because while he had five years clean, He ended up having a stroke because he was unhealthy and never took care of his body. And we get a lot into that. And then while recovering from this stroke where he never thought he'd walk again, he ended up getting a rare disease or disorder um, that ended up affecting him and left him paralyzed, okay? Now, here we are three years later. He's walking. He's healthy. He's blossoming. He's talking. He's still hilarious as ever. But there were some dark times in there. And we talk about how in the hospital, he wanted to commit suicide when he thought his life was over. And here he is. He never stopped fighting. He had a moment, moment after moment of wanting to stop fighting, but he never did. He has an incredible story. I'm so blessed to have him as a friend. He's been someone who has supported me no matter what, no matter what I've done in my life, no matter what mistakes I made. He has been there 100% to always help pick me up and me for him. And I know that that can be rare to find. So I really appreciate him. Now, listen, if anyone out there is struggling with the disease of addiction in any kind of way, shape, or form, or if you want to reach out, if you're a family member of someone with addiction, please don't hesitate. You can find me on Instagram at thehairhealer1111. And also, please feel free to email me, thehairhealer1111 at yahoo.com. I know Ken will get into how to find him, but he is also willing to help anyone struggling in any way, shape, or form. That man has a big heart. So please don't hesitate to reach out to him, okay? If you're struggling, someone is always there. Someone will help you. 
I'm really excited about this episode. So please let's let me stop talking now. Go enjoy the day. Go enjoy the first quarter moon and let's go and vibe with Ken. So welcome, Ken, to the Hair Healer Studio, aka Capriati Salon. How's it feel? Very excited. Are you excited? And you're a little yes. nervous too. Oh, right? yeah, very nervous. What were you thinking on the way over here? Um my, my life and what I might talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Were you thinking like, I really hate Colleen. I love her, but I hate <laughs> no, that she's making never, me do the never, Hair Healer podcast. Never. I felt very honored and and just surprised in a, in a you way. You felt surprised? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. You were like one of, you know, one of the first people I tried to first pick the people I knew like were very extroverted, ready to like this, this, this. And I knew that I kind of wouldn't say no to me. <laughs> so they have trouble saying no to me. So I picked those first and then I've branched out, but you were in the top because A, I've known you as a friend before really doing your hair, but um, you have such a story. I try to bring a lot of, I bring all different kinds of people on here, but I love to bring later in life, middle-aged comeback stories, right? Because we need to see those much more because everyone fucking falls apart around 40, <laughs> yes. 40 and 50. Yes. And like, how do we gain that back? Yeah. Right. How are you feeling today? This has been a crazy week. Crazy week. Yeah. Very tired. Very sore. Very like sore. the pain is shooting up and down my leg and back. And, uh, but I mean, that's like a normal event now, you know, like a daily, yeah. Chronic pain. Chronic pain. Yeah. Chronic pain. And, uh, but you know, I, I, Last night I did the Epsom salt bath with oh, the uh, bath bomb thing and uh, and you know soaked and uh, and put a couple patches on. Uh, I have the you know those uh, the pain patches that they give you. So yeah. I put some of them on my legs and my shoulder and back, and uh, it helps, but never really makes that pain go away. And then an eight hundred ibuprofen. You know, oh, like, yeah, those do a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they churn up my stomach, you know, they, yeah. they eat it alive. And so, you know, with that and that and that, um, felt a little better enough to go to sleep, you know, and, and drift off. Uh, it's it's a constant battle, but it's it just comes with the territory. You know, if you don't treat your body very well, you end up with those things, you know. Well, that's let's get into that then. I didn't yeah. know where we were going to start because right. we didn't know where we were going to start. We just sort of right. went with this. Um, which is what I know best. So, but one of Ken's journeys is, I don't know where you want to start with this, but, um, he abused his body until forties <laughs> yeah. and then yeah. some more and yep. then had a stroke at 54. Um, yeah. What was it? Two years ago. So 56. Three yeah. years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. So yeah. 56. Yeah. 56, 55, 56. How do you stay now? Like you were just sharing some of the hard days, especially probably right. when the weather is like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How do you stay in a good mindset? Because um, you stayed in some good, even when you thought you were never going to be able to right. walk again. I do uh, a lot of meditation with uh, Jack Cornfield. Like, Who's that? Uh, he's a meditation teacher, uh, you know, a spiritual guru guy. Um, is he Buddhist on um, YouTube? Yeah, you can find him on YouTube. And uh, he just has tons of like... Uh, meditations and and talks like hour long talks and so i listen to that constantly and has a great book uh that when when i was down and out and i was paralyzed with the guillain barre um i used to listen to his audio book every every day like every night and uh it's it's uh meditations in times of uh trouble you know like uh that's what the book's called yeah yeah and a guiding light you know a lamp in a darkness or something like that and uh but it's an incredible book and it kept me going like night after night. I would just fall asleep with that, like playing and a lot of nights not even be able to go to sleep just, you know, because uh, when I had that situation, like my body felt like I was being blowtorched. Uh, wow. Just, yeah, nerve endings were like, and meanwhile, I was paralyzed. I couldn't do anything. And, but like the pain would just be shooting up and down my legs. And, uh, you know, that was after the stroke. So I had the stroke. And uh, which, you know, you used to come and see me in a hospital and you give me like little stones and believe, believe it or not, I would be rubbing that all would over you? my leg. Oh, Aww. yeah. Yeah. You'd be like, this is a healing stone. And I, you'd leave, I'd be rubbing that you on would, my leg. <laughs> you probably would rub it wrong. Oh, yeah. And I'd just be like, you got to heal leg. You yeah. Know? Like we got to be able to walk again. And you're, you are walking. Oh, yeah. And, and then like when I was like succeeding, uh, recovering from the stroke, I got this, uh, the Guillain-Barre, which was an autoimmune disease, 
which they said was as rare as like. Uh, but why is it such a sexy name? I'm sorry, it's not a sexy. <laughs> uh, they're <disease>. French. <sighs> yeah, French. Sorry. Like a Dr. Guillon and a Dr. Uh, Barre, and uh, so yeah, they they both discovered this uh, autoimmune wow. disease where your cells attack like you know like nerve endings in your spine. And so that paralyzed me for like a couple months there. How long and, was that? That's when they put you back down in the main hospital. Yeah, down, down in, in Jefferson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was like for a month on itself, just being paralyzed, you know, from the neck down. So, so, shit. So that's not so sexy. So, in, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so, the least sexy I could be. <laughs> in those moments, okay, like. How do you cut? Like, what were you thinking? Like, you're paralyzed. Not sure if you're ever going right. to walk again. Or yeah. now, no, it wasn't even just your leg wasn't going to walk. Now right. you could, are you going to be, you know, not even able oh, to yeah. from your neck yep. down? So how did you keep the faith? Do you have faith? Did you have faith? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You get tight with God at that point. You know? <laughs> like, like, at first I was like suicidal. I would just be like, you know, I'm going to ride this wheelchair right out that window. And Logan, Is that what <laughs> he, was, he was visiting one time. He looked out the window. He goes, there's a roof like eight feet down. You know, you're not going to kill yourself. You might, <laughs> you might break your leg, <laughs> but you're not going to kill yourself here. You know, so I was just like, wah, wah, wah. What, what? <laughs> and uh, but at Jefferson, I was like, all right, I'm on a ninth floor. If I can get out that window. And then my wife was like, well, you're paralyzed. You're not doing anything. You can't even sit up, you know? And yeah. I just, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I was suicidal and I was listening to Jack Cornfield like every day. And the meditations were bringing me back and just like helping me like center myself. And and then I just had to start to believe like, you know, sooner or later, something else happens. Something good. Yeah. That always shifts. I, I'm not sure what's going to happen, but something else will happen. You know, this just won't keep happening. You know, yeah. like like this has already happened, so we're gonna move along from here. Like the other, the stroke had happened, and we moved along from there. And then the Guillain Barre had happened, and we're moving along from there. You know, and somehow or another, like I just kept on saying, we're gonna get up and we're gonna move again. I don't know how, but we're going to. You know, like this is not the end of the journey. Like I can't even kill myself. You know, like so. <laughs> wow. Yeah, this is not the end of the journey. No, it's like, not. People are gonna force me to like respond. And, uh, you know, like at the time did that happened, that realization happened right after you realized you couldn't, you weren't going to be able to kill yourself. <laughs> yes. Did that oh, yeah. Happen? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you turn that mindset around, said, we got to make the best of it. Yeah. After a while, you're just like, all right now, because at one point, I think I said to a nurse, like, why me? And she said, who would you rather it be? Would you rather it be your wife? Like, would you rather <laughs> it be me? Would you rather it be your friends who come to visit you? Wow, and I, was I love just, it. Yeah, and I was like, I was taken aback because <laughs> I was just like, why are you talking to me like this? <laughs> why are you being so mean? Yeah, and, uh, and she was just pointing out, though, like, yeah. what kind of perspective is that? And, she, and she was like, she had like a God, and she was like, did you ever think God gave it to you because you might be able to handle this? Yeah. Like, these other Help. people might not be able to deal with this, but somehow or another, you might. And you can just get through this and they'll help you get through this. But like, why would you want it to be somebody else? And yeah. and that that changed my perspective to be like, all right, we got to work as hard as we can. And so every physical therapy, I would just like put in as, as much as I could. And wow. uh, but, you know, like you're, you're only going to get so much better. And uh, uh, when I got it, like Jefferson, the physical therapy was literally to hoist me up and put me in a chair wow. and just sit in a chair for as long as I could. And I would melt out of that chair, like onto the floor, and because I like you I couldn't feel it, so I you couldn't, couldn't do keep anything. Yourself. So I just like slowly melt out of the chair, like. And they would be like, "Okay, try and sit there for three hours." And I was just like an hour, I would almost be on the floor. Oh my god! And I'd just be like, "Listen, just put me back in bed." Yeah. And, and so finally, they'd pick me up and put me back in bed, and I'd just be like, "All right, I did as much as I could." And uh, one day this nurse was just like, I, like my feet were touching the b bottom board and I, it felt like they were on fire. And I, I was like, can you just sheet me up, like pull me up like an inch or two? And she was like, how about you do it yourself? And I was just like, listen, I'm paralyzed. Like, can you just pull me up an inch <laughs> or two? And she was like, how about I put your hands on the, the headboard? So she put my hands up on the headboard and I was so mad at her. I pulled myself up like an inch. Wow. And that was the first like real movement wow. that I had. And and Robin came in, my wife, and and I was just like, that bitch, Jessica. <laughs> and she was like, what's, what's the matter? I was like, she made me like pull myself up. <laughs> and she was like, well, that's a miracle. 
Like well, you're yeah. you're paralyzed and you pulled yourself up. You should be thanking, thanking her. Thanking her. And I was just that like, bitch. that bitch. <laughs> and uh, later that bitch was telling me that her father had a stroke too. Wow. And like all of a sudden then I'm empathizing with her totally yeah. because I'm like, oh, I had one too. And then she's a little nicer to me after that and like ended up just being an angel, you know, like wow. so many nurses and everybody were angels. Like one of them lived on the corner of where I lived in South Philly for like 25 years. And we're just sitting there talking and he's talking about South Philly. I was like, I live down there. He was like, where? I was like, fifth and Tasker. He was like, oh, I live at sixth and Tasker. I was like, oh, that's awesome, dude. And then we just like recount like the old neighborhood, like where wow. he's at. And and I'm just naming the stores and naming all the yeah. corners and stuff. And we're just talking. And like, just that guy was an angel, like Santo. I remember these people's names. Wow, like, Santo. They're, they're engraved in my heart. You know, like, Aww. it's just incredible. Like the Santo from South Philly. Yes. This woman, Audrey, would walk in like in the mornings and just be like, it's terrific Tuesday. And Aww. I'd like, I'd be, every day she would be like, wacky Wednesday. She'd come up with another one. And and I would just like every day and her mom was sick with like MS and she would just come in every morning and just like try and pick you up and like wow. make you feel better. And like, I mean, all these people just like trying to help you out, you know? Yeah. And of course I'm like, I'm going to become a nurse <laughs> and like, you know, and then my, my close people are just like, you can't do anything right now. You, no, can't, you, have you to. can't even sit up. And I'm just like, I'm going to be a nurse and help people. Nursing. Yeah. I'm going to help people. And they were just like, no, you're not. You know, and like in my mind, I still think sometimes like I have to figure out if I can do that. Well, guess what? You're helping people right now listening to this. People are going to hear this. <laughs> right. You're an inspiration. And you can do that. Why couldn't you do that? You think you're too old to go back to too school? Too old. Yeah. Why? That's crazy. People go, we could Google now. There's 90-year-old women that go back to school. Got my GED at 48 when I came in the rooms. 48. You that's got when I got my GED. Real quick. Um, Ken and I met in a 12-step fellowship, and when we had met, <laughs> I think I had just gotten clean a couple of months into it, and you had been maybe around for a year, and the, I was at a meeting sitting, and he was in front of me chairing, and we had this, what I like to say, I felt like a smile off, like I'm very positive about upbeat, and so is he, and it's hard to find someone, like you hear, he's literally like cannot move from his neck down and he's like finding the best way to look at things. And so when you find someone like that on that frequency, we instantly, and I remember you were smiling and I was like, he has a big smile. Let me smile bigger. And, like, and then we just kept smiling and smiling. So that's the end of the story, guys. The attractive newcomer. The attra <laughs> yeah, he was trying to slide in. He was trying to slide in those DMs when I got there. <laughs> 13 step B. Yes. <laughs> Which I am not known for. You are not known at all, right? <laughs> we all, we've all been there, right? So if you don't know what a 13 step is, again, we're informing. I'm probably, I'm guessing, only, what, maybe 20% of my listeners are probably actually in yes. recovery. So um, if you don't know, it's there's 12 steps in a fellowship and there are spiritual and growth steps and blah, 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 blah. And so there's always a joke because people that have an amount of time staying clean or sober, dun, 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 <laughs> they um, get, a, you gain a lot about, about yourself. So when someone new comes in, right. And everyone addicts just want to, you know, they're all horny and you know, whatever. It's like fresh meat or something. There's this thing that if you do have time, you're then caught like, and you don't, it's called 13 stepping, right? If you hit on someone and then, Am I saying it right? Yes. Is that the good yes. description? Yeah. And I've been 13 stepped. You've been 13 yes, stepped? Yes, yes. Like By, on a computer. <laughs> on the computer? Yes. How old were they? I think 23 maybe. And they said, I want to have sex with your hair. <laughs> and and I was sitting there with my sponsee saying, how do you even reply to that? How do you reply yeah, to that? I, you I didn't for a few days. I, I just was like. I, I was in shock. I was just like, okay, I don't even know what to do. I want to have sex with your hair. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. And then finally, I was just, uh, I, I don't know how I replied, but it ended up being like, just like, you know, the the hurricane of a mess. You the hurt of a mess. Yeah. How many people in your life have you had sex with? I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 not look, enough. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're about to answer. <laughs> not enough. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Not enough, though. But so where were we in our story? Your story? Uh, doing a 13 step. <laughs> <laughs> no, before that, we were on we were on 6th and Lancer in South Philly. Tasker. Yeah, 5th and Tasker. I know and nothing was, about the no, city. That was 25 years down there wow. in South Philly. Wow. But yeah. What so, were you doing? 
um, just we bought a house. Um, no, and, what was, what were you doing? What I was doing at that point was how are you wrecking your life? I was finding a cheap place where I could have a band on the third floor, <laughs> and uh, and be close to South Street, and uh, because my sister basically grew me up on South Street, and she was a hippie. So like I grew up at Dobbs on uh, Third and South. And was in Dobbs when I was like 13, 14 what years was old. Dobbs? I was a bar on the corner. Italian bar? Nah, nah. Yeah. Like rock and roll bar. Okay. Like huge rock and roll bar. Okay. And uh, like like George Thorogood would play there. Like all these, you know, uh, Robert Hazard, um, you know, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Um, like a lot of people would play there. I don't know any of those people. Yeah. But and I'm sure some people listening do. They might. They might. And, uh, you know, and, and a shout out to Kenny Queter, who still plays. Like a lot of the people I played in bands with are all dead, you know. From the, what? The disease of addiction. Dr- all yeah, of them? Wow. A lot of them. Everyone yeah. you played drug overdose. A whole band I played with, like the bass player and the guitar player, both dead from drugs. How old were they? Um, the bass player, he went like when I had a couple years clean. And, uh, you know, he used to, and it's all a story. He used to call me up like, and then I was scared because I was like, oh, I used to party my ass off with him. I can't really <laughs> talk with him. And, uh, and when I did, he would talk to me and I talked to him what I was doing. Like, Hey, I'm in NA now, you know, and I'm clean. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, so like, uh, we, we didn't, I wouldn't talk to him for like a few months because I was scared. Yeah. And then finally, like he OD and died. And uh, I was telling my sponsor about it. And I said, I feel really guilty now that I didn't try and get him into the rooms and help him. And he said, well, now, you know, next time, if that happens, what you might want to do is bring it up and try and like, you know, just like carry the message to him and not be so scared of your past. You know, like so that's why you didn't. What were you scared of with your past? You were scared he was going to come back, and you were. Gonna I was go scared back to that. Yeah, I would hang out of... with them, and then all of a sudden I'd be like doing drugs again with them. You know. And you spent how long did you spend in active addiction using drugs? Um, I started very early, like experimenting, at like eight, nine years old. You know, and uh, and then until forty-eight years old. Let me ask you something. At that age, was there like were you in a traumatic home? Oh, yeah. 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 You like know. there was not a lot of happiness. No, nah, no. Nah. I had the addict mother who sometimes I equate like, you know, I'll be like a wolf, you know, and then I'll be like, well, that's short shorting a wolf because a wolf at least has fur and would probably be warm to wow. like cuddle with, you know, like wow. my mom was just a hardcore addict and uh, alcohol and Scottish. And Scottish, yes. They're kind of cold in general a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not you. I'm correct. Yeah. That's just stereo- that's a joking yeah. stereotype. My mom had a lot of serious problems. And uh, and so they were passed to me, a lot of them. And, uh, you know, and plus, like, all that other stuff that goes on in people's lives, like, you know, abuse, like, you know, sexual abuse, wow. uh, physical abuse. And, really? uh All kinds, you know, so... And no one to talk about it with. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, and just, you know, like a weird neighbor who, like, you know... Who like had, you know, whatever. It was like 1969, 68, you know. Wow. So it was a crazy world back then, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, so he had weed from his older brother. And so I would try to smoke that, like, you know, eight years old. And wow. how how wacky are you gonna get at eight years old? You're already a whack job. You know? like, <laughs> at eight? <laughs> yeah. It's like how much more of a fantasy you can you incorporate into your world when you're eight? You know, wow. it's it's already a fantasy so world. So do you remember getting high at eight years old? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, did you actually like get and, stoned? And feeling just like, you know, like terrified and weird and everything and, and uh, excited and excited. Oh yeah. Yeah. At eight. Yeah. Wow. And, and I mean, it was like, you know, Sergeant Peppers and it was, it was everything back then, you know, yeah. it was like, you know, like, you know, it was just crazy stuff. And, uh, so like life was like that. And, and my sister was a hippie. So like, I remember hiding her weed from my mom like not taking any, but just hiding it. And and then I remember like hanging out at my sister's when I was like 12 or 13 and stealing her weed and smoking it in her house, even though she wouldn't have cared if I'd done it or not. And I'd be walking around like trying to air it out. So when she came home, she wouldn't know I'd smoked her weed in her house. Like, you know, and, and just like always doing that kind of shady shit and, and growing up like that. Wow. And, uh, you know, and, and just like crazy stuff. And and so I was destined to like, you know, and, and me, I thought I'd be like 80 years old doing a party, 
You and, really did? You saw yourself oh, yeah, like yeah. Playboy bunnies, just, short and just coke. old, yeah, yeah. And and rock and roll. <laughs> and rock and roll. And, wow. And, and and the thing with rock and roll is you think it's sex and drugs and rock and roll, but really it's like a business and they don't want people who are all screwed up on <laughs> drugs. Yeah. So like they want to make money. I, I would can. get kicked out of every band that I would be in because I would be too high and loaded. How long? And uh, year after year. Like, you know, I, I started playing when I was like 17. And, uh, you know, they kicked me out and uh, I was playing drums and you don't want a drummer that's all like drunk and high no. and methed out. And like and that just continued on until I was, I don't even know, like 27, 28, you know, just like getting kicked out of bands. And, and you know, I mean, getting kicked out of a band by like a crack smoker, you know, like, <laughs> like how is he kicking me out of the band? That's when you know it's bad. He's how smoking he- crack. <laughs> You know, he's hiding upstairs, like smoking crack, and, and like and kicking me out of what a did band. He say? Why do you say? <laughs> he, they, they had another singer prior to me, and uh, you know, and and I don't want to mention any names, but it was. But the, we're going to mention. Them but I will mention. I will mention they were the first all black punk rock band. That's cool. And uh, and so at a certain point they broke up. So the drummer and the guitar player were still playing. So they incorporated me. And, and it was in Philly? Yeah, How me cool and the bass that? player who who I was talking about who passed away ended up being in the band. I mean, and that's like a childhood fantasy of mine. I knew this guy when I was like 17 years old. Like I used to see posters of his band and just be like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Wow. And then all of a sudden I'm playing in his band. You manifested. Yeah. And I'm just like, and I'm singing for him. You know, wow. and I'm just like, you know, and we we play these shows and uh, and I'd just be out front of this kick ass band. And meanwhile, though, I was totally loaded, could not stop like getting loaded, you know, doing blow and drinking like just enormous amounts, falling off like everything, bar stools wherever I went, you know. Was like, this like an every night, every weekend? Oh, yeah, every night, every day. Like just uh, I was making T-shirts at the time, printing T-shirts. <laughs> And so I would make so much money, like a thousand bucks a week back in like 85, like, you know, which was a lot. And, uh, and, and I was, I was just a drug addict and a drunk. And so like, I would just walk out 13th and South down to 6th and South to Manny Browns with my friends and just start at like at seven o'clock at night. And then just go until like early in the morning. Head from like Manny Browns down to the After Hours Club and just keep it going. And just cycle through. Yeah. And then wake up and, and be, be at T-shirt shop at like noon or one o'clock and just start the whole thing for again. how long did you do that for? That was for like maybe one or two years. And then finally Robin was like, get out. I've had enough. <laughs> Robin's his wife. Yes. Like one she night. She kicked you out. Oh, yeah. I came home and I would take off my leather jacket, which had all these chains on it, and it would just jingle and jangle. And I'd take off like my cowboy boots at the bottom of the stairs and I would try to sneak up the stairs. And of course, I had a puppy at the time. So Rocco just starts barking when I come in the house and I'm like trying to tiptoe up the stairs at 430 in the morning and, uh, you know, sun coming up. And she's just like, I can't take this anymore. Get out. <laughs> and me, I'm just like taking a bong hit like, OK, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. So where'd you go? Uh, friend's couch. You know, bartender's couch. Bartender's couch. Yes. And and so and then to the print shop. And then my friend went away to Jamaica for a month. He was the one doing the whole like t-shirt job. Yeah. And uh he was like, stay at my place for a month. So I just was off the deep end. It was just like, you know, crazy strippers, drugs. <laughs> yeah, strippers and drugs and and alcohol. Was it fun? Oh my God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was rock and roll. When did it not get fun? Like, how long after, like, when did the party end? When did the rock and roll party end? When did it start getting, like, you know? That's another point where I'm sitting at the bar, like, at Manny Brown's, and I'm just I'm just looking in the mirror, and, and I can't get any higher, any more, like, loaded, and I'm just depressed. And and I I don't think anybody a girl's coming in that night that I'm going to be able to talk into letting me stay at their house. Wow! And that's how you'd get out of yourself and not yes. feel depressed. Yeah, and not look at yourself as to sleep with someone. Right. And and I and and the guy was coming home from Jamaica, so I was going to lose the apartment that I had for a month. Wow. And I was just like, okay, we got to figure out something here. So of course. I go like while I'm doing all this, I'm playing in the band and I'm I'm at a show and Robin comes in with a guy. Your and, wife at the yeah, time. They're and separated I, and he's and I'm on the stage 
and I have the microphone. So they're playing like a rockabilly like riff behind me. And I start just saying, you stone cold bitch. <laughs> and I just start singing this song, Stone Cold Bitch, because it's her and this guy. And I'm getting angrier and angrier How long on ago stage. Was this? That, that was 85. Okay. And I'm so Thank angry you. on stage that I'm just screaming stone cold bitch at her, like who's just standing there with this guy. Wow. And the guy's a great artist. And I'm just so furious though. And uh, so they leave and, and we get done. Did you do- feel bad you did that? Or no, no. I was, I was like, crazy, how did this like bitch long hair rocking crazy. So I'm done. I, ta- I toss the mic down. I follow them out <laughs> there. They go home to South Philly, like to my old house. I walk all the way there because I don't even have bus fare or cab fare. I'm <laughs> broke. I make a thousand dollars a week and I'm broke on a Tuesday night, you know, in 1985, in 1985, <laughs> I've pawned my cymbals. I've, I've sold my drum set. I've sold anything I have worth money. And this is basically just from cocaine. Oh yeah. Cocaine, alcohol. alcohol yeah. Basic, yeah. Wow. Pills and weed. Wow. You know? And not heroin. No, no, wow. no. Because my sister taught me well, like, don't, don't do heroin. Don't do meth. And of course I messed up with the meth thing. And she yelled at me for that because she came to the house. I, she, they didn't see me on South street for like a week. And she came over to my apartment and I was just laying like in piss and I couldn't even stand up. Like my knees felt like they were broke. And uh, she was just like, what happened to you? And I was just like, I don't know. I was doing meth. And she was like, I told you not to do that. <laughs> and I was but just everything like, else was a fine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't do meth and don't shoot heroin, you know? That's it. And, and I was just like, all right, but everything else is okay, you know? Like acid. Like, you and know? you never looked at it, at, right? It's like. Nah, nothing was, nothing was wrong with anything, you know? Quaaludes, cocaine, let's yeah. go, you yeah. know? Let's mix whatever we mix, you know? Booze, quaaludes, and I cocaine. I remember this one time um, I after I had overdosed, and I talk again a little bit on the show about my past drug problems, and <laughs> just to think about the way we think, and my sister had come in, and at that point, I had not overdosed on heroin, right? I had been clean for a couple of weeks off of that. I just come out of treatment, but I had overdosed from five other things, okay? And so my sick mind, when I was in the hospital, my sister's there, right? She's one of the first people. She came with them or something, and she's sitting there, maybe 22 at the time, and the doctor comes in. He said, well, you know, I'm just waking up. He's like, do you want us to read what was in your system? And I said, yes, and read in front of my, and I scanned, read in front of my sister because I thought she'd be happy that there wasn't heroin in there. And she was like, <laughs> and when they read everything that was in my system, she had just looked at me like dead. In, and I said, what? And she was like, are you kidding? And I said, I thought you'd be happy. There's no heroin. And like, <laughs> we're laughing because we're addicts, but at, and especially if you're struggling, if you, not if you're struggling with addiction, but if you are a family member of someone struggling with addiction, that is the way we think. We get so caught up in self-centeredness that like, wait, I'm not, but you know, I couldn't see that. I still <laughs> had almost died. And if you're an addict, maybe you don't want to listen to me talk about the glorification of drugs. Yes. Because it always, because yes. trust me, it always ends up. That's, yes. And, and usually I don't like if you ever see me at a meeting, I never share the war stories. No, but the hair healer, it's a special yeah, occasion. We this is it. special occasionally because when we I go to into my past, the other 70 yes, people. when I go into my past, my past is a lot of glorification of yes. drugs and alcohol. Well, that was a lot you of know. your life. Yes. And there is a glorifying glamour to that. Right. And the movies you watch, why do half the people wanted to be <laughs> right. rock stars? Right. For yes. women drugs, sex, oh, yeah. and that's it. And so, you know, it's cool to have you here, like a long age of how that never ended up. You know, when did your, after that, what happened? Was your life just a series of then? Oh yeah. Yeah. And then I just wanted to go home, like to my wife and, and throw so, myself so what, on how, the mercy of you, the court. How did you get back with your wife? Threw myself on the mercy of the court. <laughs> What'd you say? Another time where I walked in, it was just like, I promise I will never do this again. You know? And, and of course, like it would happen multiple times again and again and uh, just be caught in terrible situations doing terrible things. But, you know, she's a Sag and I'm a Sag. So, <laughs> you know who it's like, you know who I am. You just, I'm just laughing because you're like, we would do terrible things to each other. But she's a Sag and I'm a Sag. Yes. And, you know, and it's true, that energy. And you got to get that fire energy. And, and neither of you care about anything. No. You know, and and if the other person leaves, the other person leaves. <laughs> that adventure is kind yeah. of a beautiful thing. It's like go. So, what's the selling of you and Robin been married? Um, since ninety two, married, and eleven years before that, I was in living together. I was four. So we were 
38 years together coming up. And you guys have, you've only heard the beginning of how to rocky, <laughs> yeah. to say up and down yes, relationship. Yes, yeah. Um, so then how do people get through that? How do people stay 30 some years married through bullshit and through fine, right? Because not you brought a lot of bullshit, but mostly because you grew up in a traumatic life or right. never taught your emotions or how to live life. So then you want 20 more years living out these patterns with everyone that right. you learned. And so how were you able during that time? Are you two or you don't know? How do we make it to 30 years? You have an incredible partner who's just, you know, like who studies life. Like she turned me on to the Jack Hornfield. Really? Know? She She's turned me on to so many different like spiritual things and stuff. And so like by doing that, she enabled me to grow. Not only did she enable me to do a lot of like bad behaviors, but she enabled me to grow into a person I am now wow. who she's like very like excited to know now, you yeah. know, like, like, because I've changed a lot, you know, and we have the immense process. So the immense process is more than I'm sorry. And so like the past couple of years, three years, I've had to really put in an effort of being more than I'm sorry. Then how, how do you become yeah. more than I'm sorry? Um, how would you become more than I'm sorry to her? To her, I just had to stop like all those patterns and behaviors, bullshit. all that bullshit. Would yeah. you be more present with her? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, before, like when I got in the program, seven nights a week, you know, and twice Out on a Saturday or something. Uh, such you know? a f sad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and just like, you know, that took over my life as the party, you know, and, and going out every night afterwards. And, and so I just escaped from the house into that. Whereas before I used to escape from the house into like, you know, a bar and a party. Yeah. Whereas like, you know, I escaped from the house into, you know, N.A., you know, and we say sometimes we hide in the program, you know. Yeah. And I was, you know, and uh, and then we went through like a traumatic experience where like, you know, like we were just like, OK, I guess that's it, you know. And uh, and so I, I was I was literally like, OK, well, maybe we should separate. And she was like, well, I don't want to separate. Let's just get a divorce. <laughs> So, and, and me being, me being myself, I was just like, let me call your bluff and say, okay. Okay. She, <laughs> yes. Because I don't really believe you, but I'll go along with this. Let's do a divorce. And when I met him, they were going to get divorced. Oh yeah. Yeah. You like, were still, still living together. Walked around the house and just was like, that's yours. That's mine. That's yours. That's mine. We so were, after 30 years, it was a pretty peaceful kind of. Oh yeah. Already, we were, yeah. And it was that simple. Like our stuff was literally like, like almost labeled. Because wow. there was her and there was me together in the same place, but like two separate people, yeah, living two separate in people the... living together, and and with all her things, like her antique stuff, <laughs> and and like and just all my junk that I like collected throughout the years from the streets, like just going, oh, look at this crazy like video game, like there's a <laughs> console here, there's a... I'm gonna carry that home from like you know like fourth and uh, Washington. <laughs> I don't even know how I got it fourth and in Washington. Keep all your stuff? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. You know, like I would always have like a studio room someplace and she would have a studio room someplace of in the house. Like we've always been lucky where we've had a big house, you know. I think what's cool about your relationship, what I've known, and mind you, they're married again after they'll yeah. get to that after the stroke. There was there was a love story comeback, but um you both seem to have always allowed each other to be who you were. Oh yeah, yeah. And maybe you have to with two Sages, but it seems like even her, we've discussed her, you know, throughout life. And she's very much does her own thing, has her life. She got this. And and same with you. And you both have always just like, all right, if that's the path you want to take, then take that. And oh, yeah. Yeah. I respect. And that's a cool thing. A lot of people can't do that. And I, I've always equated it. And I was telling my uh, therapist this. I was like, you know, it's sort of like, well, the gate's open. Go ahead. The dog's getting out of the yard, you know, and he walks around the neighborhood. He's all like, you know, just crazy in the neighborhood, yeah. running up to other houses, running into other yards and finally comes around a block and goes, oh, I'm home again. You know, the gate's still open. I'm going into my yard. Yeah. You know, I love my yard. I love my house. I love the people that love me. So it took, right, because that's what the universe does, if you would say, you to basically lose your health, which means lose yes. everything yeah. to see holy shit, look what I actually have in life. And oh, yeah. why does it take us to do that as human? Why does it always take someone to die or, right. you know, some traumatic event to happen? Like just to, to get realize. into the program, you know, like yeah. I got to hit rock bottom and to like get my so, life back, I had to hit rock bottom after a few years of just complete insanity, which I mean, I cop to, you know, like I even cop to when I'm in the rooms, like, you know, 
like I, I would put, and now it's like my whole new thing is like, I'm not putting down my recovery. Like for a long time I would share, I would say people like, you know, like, well, you know what I'm like, you know, because I'm honest about how I am and, and, you know, I got a sloppy recovery and now I'm just like, you know what? My recovery is badass. Your recovery is like badass. I got ten years coming up in 10 March. Years ten drug years in March. And yes. Alcohol free. That's amazing. Yes, and and I'm like you know I help people and I do what I'm supposed to do. You I do what so they told people. me to do. You know, and uh, and so now like my big thing is like I've made this huge turnaround like with the sickness, and so I'm just like, all right, well maybe that's what it took. You know, and uh, and sometimes it does. And with Robin, like you know, she I was talking to her like today and last night and just saying like, you know, like, I don't know why you did this. Like, I still don't understand. And why she's, do you mean why she stayed with you? Yeah. And she's, helped you she nursing. just came, she helped me out, like kept me alive. And they nursed. were about to get a divorce. And when right. he had this stroke, she literally came in like a guardian angel. Oh yeah. Like every day to come see me and then coming down Jefferson every day, like to Philly and going back to her work and then coming down to like, you know, and getting me to riddle like out of Jefferson to riddle to final rehab, you know, like she did all that work for me and, and helped me. And, and she didn't have to. And I said to her, you know, you didn't have to. And she's like, well, I love you. Aww. And I said, yeah, I know. I said, but there's a lot of people that love each other. I said, and then they take the credit card and they leave them yeah. and they have the credit card and they run a credit card bill up and the bill goes back to the person they love. Yeah. You know, and I just did the finger quote thing. <laughs> because Wait, because that's what you did to her? No. No. Oh, oh, okay. No, I just hear stories. <laughs> oh, of, I know. You know, people, people get sick and the uh, partner oh, just horrible. goes, forget you. I'm out of here. That's and horrible. I'm selling a house and you're you're a bastard anyway. And and look at all the shitty stuff you've done. And I'm selling a house without you and I'm I'm leaving. You know, but she didn't do that. No. And and I even said to her, I said, you know, you would have been fully in your rights to just have said, you know what? Good luck. You know, you're Sign a real. Our. Yeah, you're a real bastard. You know, <laughs> these past few years. And, and she did, you know, like she said to me, she said, you know, I'm not like these young girls. Like, I'm I'm going to wait until you get better and I'm going to leave. You know, and I was just Aww. like, touche, you know, like. Touche, but she yeah. didn't leave. No, she didn't leave. And she's allowed me to like really bear down and work on myself the past couple of years. Like I've been in therapy doing like, you know, every week I get to go to therapy, which is just it's a beautiful God, thing. A I, godsend. Yeah. You know, I have insurance, so I get to go to therapy, you know, yeah. whereas it That's should be blessing. free for everybody, it's you know, like. I can't believe we don't give like mental health therapy to people just because like, hey, you need it. I say that all the time. <laughs> there should be, that should be something just like they made a push for women to get gynecology, right. you know, for free. If you can't, there should be something to, everyone should get free mental health. Yeah. If you don't agree with everything else free, because there's a lot of improvements we need, because I think with free mental health care, that would save a lot of issues. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Save so and lives, many issues. you know, like people that just kill themselves. And I was in that literal position. What does that feel like in that moment when you want to, like, I don't know what, I guess what I'm asking for is what does it feel like to want to kill yourself? That, that darkness. Peace? Yeah. That darkness. And just like, you think, like, Did you feel I, peace, though, I always think of, like of that surrender, like in, in NA, like my surrender to like, oh, this is how I cope with the day. And then like, it becomes a thing of like, well, my final surrender is I just leave. But then it's like, that's so selfish in its own right. You know, like, like I kill myself and then, you know, the wreckage, you this know. person who loved me and nursed me back to health has to deal with that. And that's when she finally said, like, listen, you cannot say that anymore. I can't listen to you say that one more what, day. What, about wanting to kill yourself? Yeah, yeah. She, and then she'd be like, that's why I want to leave you. And it's like, <laughs> well, and for good reason, because somebody who's just suicidal is scary. Yeah. You know, like it's a scary thing to be around. And it was a scary thing to be. Never mind to be around. I can't even imagine, you know, like somebody just like telling you that, you know, like I wish I would die. I can't believe I ever I didn't die. You know, like that was my big thing was like, you know, why didn't I die when everything happened? And she'd just be like, you cannot have that thought. You can't. That's a you know? horrible yeah. thing. So why is me victim? Yeah. Why not me? Yes. What's the lesson I need to learn yep. here? What? That's Let's talk about the day and the night of the stroke. Because I think that will, the day and the night that you had the stroke, I think will be a good representation of where you were yeah. mentally, physically, spiritually, probably, yes. right? Oh, yeah. Yep. So tell it where, what, where? <laughs> that. I mean, at the time I would sleep maybe two hours a night, you know, I would be up like in, in 
wherever Lineville, Eagleville, wherever that is, Lineville, up up in, near Pottstown or up 100. Yeah. I would drive home at like three or four in the morning. I would get in, I'd go to sleep for like two hours, wake up and go to work. Like I, I had like just insanity of not sleeping. And I would think like- What I, would you think? If I can stay up for 48 hours, I'm I'm like a monster. I'm invincible. You, you would know? think that? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and Clean. like my therapist was telling me like that is a manic reaction like you get- So when are you, you bipolar? When you lack sleep, you, you go through- uh, I don't know. Oh, just when yeah. you don't- When just... you don't sleep, you go through this manic episode where you wow. just begin to like, you know- Rationalize the most unrational stuff. Mostly, like you just yeah. smoked a bunch of math. <laughs> yes, and that's how I would function like every day, wow. you know. And and like I would just think like, okay, the longer I can stay up, the more I can just accomplish of like this insanity. And you're eating horribly. Oh yeah, yeah. And then finally, like my blood pressure pills were making me feel sluggish and like I felt sick. So I said, I'm not taking them. So I didn't take how them long, for how long? For like a few days. And then all of a sudden I felt better. And I was like, okay, I'm not going back on them. And so for like weeks, I went without my blood pressure medicine and going through the other insanity and, and stuff with like a person where, you know, like I'm just trying to Emotional control, insanity. control a situation that is uncontrollable and, and just going through the emotional insanity and, uh, you know, and, and volunteering for it all too. Not like anybody had anything to do with me being this insane, yeah. except for Ken, who was at the controls driving, you know, and <laughs> you were driving the insanity. Oh yeah. Bus. Yes. <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> and, uh, come on aboard kids. On. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it just got deeper and deeper like that. And so one night I went to sleep with my feet up. I would sleep on a couch, just like pass out and get, get up and go to work. I slept with my feet up on a coffee table and I woke up and my leg was like, you know, felt like it fell asleep, you know? And, uh, so I got up and I'm limping around just saying like, Oh, that's weird. Like I fell asleep on it wrong. And, uh, so it carried with me throughout the day. And and then it got like, okay, I'm getting control of it again, you know? And then it was just like- And then oh. you went to Wawa. <laughs> was that the- Wait, are you talking to the night of the stroke? Oh, no. The the night of the big stroke, I, I oh, ended so up- So you were having mini strokes? Oh, I think I had some mini strokes <gasps> and just ignored them. And so, and and meanwhile, what was great was I go to a Wednesday Sick night girl. meeting and I'm, I'm trying to walk up a curb and I trip on a curb. Really? And a, a person laughs like behind me. And later I go, you know, I was having a stroke that day. And they were like, oh my God, I'm so but sorry I laughed at you. Yeah. Because you didn't have the big stroke yet. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, fucking, I'm driving joking. out to- so you uh, just told them that you had a stroke yeah, after that. I'm driving out bad. to Saturday night, uh, Dub C, and arguing with the person on the phone, you know, because I bought tickets and they wanted the tickets to this concert. And I'm like, you'll get your tickets <laughs> and driving like, you know, and, and having an aneurysm anyway. And uh, I get to Dub C and I can barely like walk around. Like I'm, I'm literally like dragging my leg and, and like another person is like, what is wrong with you? Like wow. some, something is seriously wrong now. It's not just like your legs tired. You, something is seriously wrong. And I was like, okay. And so I drive home and I'm driving by this uh, place, Thunderbird Pizza. And I'm like, I know that Burma. I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to get a cheesesteak to take home. And I said, you know, if you're having a heart attack, that'll probably kick it into gear. And Is I said, said, yeah. Said? And I said, but if you're having a heart attack, it might be the last cheesesteak you ever have. <laughs> so why don't you get the cheesesteak? So I got so the, the cheesesteak. I got the cheesesteak. I go home. And I take the cheesesteak. I can't. Now I'm walking like the bug guy from like Man in Black. I'm like, ah. You know, Remy does that. I <laughs> ask him to do it the time. He says, is this better? Sorry, my son. <laughs> ask him to do it. Sorry, continue. Oh, I definitely will. Yeah. And so I'm walking like that guy. I walk into the Wawa and I scare this lady. And she. I'm looking at her and she's just like, oh, my <laughs> God. And uh, so I, I drive home. Wait, why did you go to Wawa? I would get chips. <laughs> And because now I'm just all in. I'm like, all right, well, you're this th this won't matter. Chips and a cheesesteak. And you're and, uh, dying pretty much. Oh, driving. yeah. Yeah. Like just stumbling around now, <laughs> like walking like a maniac. Sorry. And uh, I go home and. This I, is such a way a Sagittarius would handle a stroke. And I'm, I'm like, sorry. OK, I'm going up to my room to eat this cheesesteak because I want some peace. So I can't even walk up the stairs. I'm throwing a cheesesteak up like three stairs and then crawling up the and three stairs behind it. Oh, no, or not saying anything to anybody. <laughs> Taking the cheesesteak another few stairs, crawl up after it, finally get it upstairs, eat the cheesesteak in my bed, and then wake up the next day and the whole left side's just shut down. Like my arm You're doesn't work. No. And I, I'm, I can barely get out of bed. So I got to call Robin and just be like, Robin. 
I can't get out of bed. And she's like, what's going on? I was like, I don't know. And then finally, I'm, I've surrendered. I got to go to the hospital. You're connected to the dogs yes. from the last. I got to go to the hospital. And she's like, okay. She's like, come on. And I go, but I got to go to the deck first and smoke about five or six cigarettes. <laughs> and she's like, what are you talking about? You know? And I'm like, well, if I go to the hospital, if I go to the hospital and I think I have to stay, because at that point I think, okay, this isn't a quick fix. I, I'm not going to be able to go smoke. And I, I got to smoke because I'm at two packs a day at that point. Wow. No, no blood pressure. Two medicine, packs of cigarettes. Eating cheesesteaks. No- right. Wow. And uh, so then I'm just like, I go out back, I'm smoking cigarettes. How many did you smoke? Oh, like three or four. Because <laughs> I could smoke so fast at that point in time. So I'm just like chaining these down. Finally, get in the car. We go to... uh uh the uh, patient first, not the hospital. You didn't go to the patient? No, because- After lunch, you know, when you told me the story, you were in the hospital like a month out. So this oh, yeah. is hilarious now because I don't know all, I knew the details, like the Wawa and the steak, but you're ridiculous. Continue. So we're patient first and they're like taking my blood pressure and it's it's skyrocketing. And and they're like, okay. And, and they're like, you need to go to the hospital. I was like, okay. And they're like, we're going to call an ambulance. I was like, the car's right out here. We're not going in an ambulance. Because at that point, I'm embarrassed. Yeah. And I was like, I just got to get out of patient first. Yeah. And so, so we're <laughs> wait, like, wait, they wanted you to take an ambulance. Yeah. First. So we're like, we're going in the car. And they go, okay, you have to sign this. I'm like, what is it? They're like, an MMA. It's against our doctor's advice. I said, I've heard of these in rehab, I've heard- <laughs> but I've never heard of these at a patient never, first. Never. <laughs> I was like, but here, I'll sign and I'm leaving. Goodbye. Yes, goodbye. So we drive to the hospital. We pull up to the hospital. Did and- you not want to take the ambulance because of insurance too? Oh, all of it. Oh, yeah. I Just never wanted the to embarrassment, yeah. the money for an ambulance. Yep. And uh, so we get to the hospital. And of course, Robin doesn't pull right into the uh, port, the emergency <laughs> ward port. <laughs> she pulls into a parking space, like right outside this of it. This is the world's longest stroke. Oh my god! So now, so now I got to get out of the car and walk over like a mound of mulch. And you've been easily stroking, having <laughs> oh, yeah, a stroke for about yeah. twenty-four hours now. Oh, at least, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and had a cheesesteak on top of it. <laughs> some cigarettes. And, and so now we walk into the uh, emergency ward. And they're like, what's the problem? Robin's like, uh, you know, she explained it. And they're like, okay, we're getting somebody right away. So, boom. I'm like, within 20 minutes, I'm in the ICU. Oh, my God. And and I'm like laying out. And they're like, okay, we're going to do a uh, MRI. They come back. They're like, and meanwhile, I'm like bargaining with God. I'm just like, God, you get me out of this. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, like, I, I believe in you. <laughs> I believe in you. I read the Bible. Yeah. I'll study and, it. and so, like, all of a sudden, the guy walks back. He goes, Mr. Orr, you had a stroke. Wah, wah, wah. Wow. You know, meanwhile, they're like going stuff like raise your hands. And I'm raising my hands. And later I told Robin, I was like, I remember raising my hands. She's like, your left arm didn't move. It didn't move. And I was like, well, in my mind, I said, I remember to raise them. That's and they, weird. They being perfectly together. And she's like, no, nah, nothing <laughs> happened. She's like, the nurse said to me, like, that thing's never moving again. That's what the nurse said yeah, to her. Yeah, to her. You know, and then meanwhile, like NA starts showing up. Like, boom. People. One, yeah, my home group showed up. Like, and then they just followed me everywhere, you know? Everywhere. Like, yeah. And then you were showing up at the uh, Bryn Mawr Rehab Hospital. Right like, all these people were showing up. And that was just a beautiful thing, you know? And then Robin, every single day, just, like, coming in to, like, cheer me on and take care of me, you know? For how and, many days? Um, Until you got home, 90 90 days? straight days in the hospital, yeah. Wow. And your wife showed up every day? Every day. And, uh... And they rebuilt their relationship. And I really didn't deserve it. And, and you know, but but what I did deserve was another chance, you know, like like we always, you know, N.A., another chance. It doesn't matter how low you went, you know, and I've been, I was low before. Yeah. But even clean, I went pretty low, you know, and insane. So it's like to be able to get another chance. And like I said, to be able to just show somebody I love, like, listen, this means a lot to me, and whatever I got to change, I'm going to change, you know? Wow. And you did, and you're changing it. Oh, yeah. You're doing yeah, it instead yeah. of all the years you spent saying you were going to change. Oh, like, completely, yeah. You, you know? had to be broken down. Yeah, just crushed. And, and I mean, a lot of that, Was that like, the last time you smoked a cigarette? Oh, yeah, yeah. Last time I had a cheesesteak, too. Really? You've never had I've, a cheesesteak? I've had a steak, like a regular steak, which I'm allowed on special occasions, like yeah. coming up on Valentine's Day, we're going to IC, so I'll be able to have nice. a steak. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know, because we're still young and in love. Oh. <laughs> and uh See, now they're so we're going out Valentine's Day, right? You know, and uh so I mean I fought back hard because I, I 
you know, I owe her so much, not only like just that, but I, you know, I said to my, my therapist, I was like, you know, I like to think I'm the kind of person that would do that for somebody else. But I said, deep down inside, I'm not sure I could like do what she did, you know, like, takes a really selfless like forgive person. me forgive and, you. and to love me like that, you know, like that takes an incredible amount of like love, you know. Oh my God. Uh, forgiveness oh, yeah. and love yeah. and compassion and speak so much yeah. of her. And she's probably an old soul. She's probably her, maybe her last lifetime here, maybe oh, another one. I could believe that. Yes. You know, like, because like what she did for me to like help me, like I could never repay that except to try and be the person who she thinks I am. Like she said that to me when I got clean, she was like, I used to always pray that you could get your shit together. Because then one day, you know, she said, but I never thought you were going to be this person who I always knew you could be, but you were never turning into it. You know, <laughs> like you yeah. just fought it all the way, tooth and nail. Why'd you fight it? Because like I said, I thought I'd be 80 years old, rocking and rolling, you, you know, just had no... <laughs> no concept of like stopping, you know, wow. I was an addict, you know, yeah. like couldn't stop. And like NA had to stop the drugs for me. And then like, you know, the sickness had to push me into therapy and help me stop like a lot of the behaviors and so. really dive into your inner child oh, yeah. childhood yeah. Yeah. and fixing that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is a great, we're at our mark. It's been, okay. fit. we're getting near the end of this interview. That is, I'm just in wow because I have known Ken for <laughs> eight years now through, a, we've been through a lot some relationships <laughs> with people and he's always there to listen to me and I'm always there to listen to him. Yep. But like even hearing that story so much of it, I heard your story a million times. I heard you share the hope with millions of drug addicts, but like I it still heard something new about you, you know? And like, you were such a hope you're so real and you're raw and you're like, look, I had a fucked up childhood. I fucked up for this amount of years, and then this is how I'm making it up, and it's not too late. And I think that's an incredible message, and an authentic message, and a real message. I'm really happy. So I end these this these interviews with three questions. Okay, have you listened to the Ariela podcast through the whole episode yet? I never heard the three questions. So that means you have not listened to an entire episode of the Ariela podcast. No, <laughs> and listen to it to one before before you listen to yours the whole way through. So that's even more of a surprise, and so you don't know what questions are coming. Right. Um, what would you tell young Ken? What would you tell your inner child, Ken? Young Ken, practice music better. Don't get so high. You know, have Don't more, get so yeah, high. <laughs> you know, have more sex, more rock and roll, and uh, you know, but not more drugs. But not more drugs. <laughs> yes. Just more no try not to do any yeah. drugs. Do but... the rock and roll and the sex more. Wow. <laughs> 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 young Ken. Well, I'm loving that because it's a great Ken answer. Most people have answered like, <laughs> um, you know, love yourself. You've come <laughs> I believe in you. <laughs> you said have more sex, rock and roll. Don't do so many drugs. Which is, I mean, true. You know what I mean? Um, what is the best advice anyone has ever given you? Now, you, you could use stuff that I've given you, but they hear enough on the regular. So someone else, well, no. <laughs> I think I just told you the story, like right before we started talking, was about uh, my sister's boyfriend, Robin, yes. telling me like, stop thinking about what other people are thinking about you yes. because they're only thinking about themselves. They are. You know, they are. And, and if they aren't, they're thinking about, um, they're making some sort of judgment on you based on their own right. shit, internal shit. Yeah. So that was the best advice I got from anybody was stop worrying about what other people are thinking. I feel like you're a lot like me, even though we do worry, but we were kind of also born with like not giving a fuck <laughs> right. what people think also. We still have our worries. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? So don't worry what people think. Do you still worry now what people think about you? Not as much, no. 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 That's good. And that was like when I was eight, nine years old, you know. Walking in a street full of grownups, just thinking like they're all looking at me and and at that age, at that age, yeah, they're all like judging me. At that age, and, that sense, and and then him just straightening it out, like these people are in their own little world, own you little know, world. That's all these eight business or nine. people, yeah. Wow, yeah. that means that's how much you heard of that as a child before oh, yeah. that that yeah. programming. Um, what what do you want to leave to our listening audience? Everyone that's tuned in today to the big Ken or special. <laughs> South Street special. Uh, just, uh, you know, the gospel is love, you know, so try and love each other, you know, 
and love each other. Love each other. Yeah. As much as you can. And uh, my sponsor sponsor says, love more. Love more. Love more. And, I, love and I like to think of that. Like whenever I'm having any judgmental, you know, mind, like love more, you know, like, like, you know, oh, I hate Trump or something like love more. Love know? more. Because like, you know, I always like I'm more, I'm into this Christianity now. So it's like, you know, like I go, okay, well. You You're know, into this Christianity. Oh, yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, got baptized, you know, go to yeah. church as often as I can yeah, good. and learn so much, you know, and I'll give a shout out the Blue Root Vineyard Church, you know, uh, you know. Do they I like, make wine too? Uh, no. Okay. No. I like the five o'clock Saturday uh, service myself personally and, uh, you know, great pastors there. What do you get stuff. out of it? Yeah. Um, just like I said, that love, like the pastor is able to get across, like, you know, Christianity, like simple for me, like, you and know, in a loving way, not yeah, a judging yeah, way. Yeah, not a judging way. Cause I don't think I would have found it if it was any other way presented, except the really loving manner of like, you know, my, my pastor, Mark, you know, he's able to just put it in really simple terms for me to understand. And, and, you know, we, we always say in the meetings, you know, take, take what you need and leave the rest, you know? So it's like, you know, there's there's stuff that I really truly need, and then there's stuff that you know I just don't con I don't have the mind to get around it yet. Yeah, you know, but I'm learning. So you know, like if I could tell anybody anything, love more. You know, love more. And and like one of my favorite Bible quotes is "Love each other as I have loved you." You know, that's like one of my favorite quotes out of the Bible. You know, why? Yeah, no, I love that. And, and why can't we? Why can't we come for? Well, <laughs> right. I yeah. mean, it's because so many people are walking around injured child who grew up with the opposite. If you don't grow up with love, you're not going oh, yeah. to yeah. receive yeah. it yeah. or give it yeah. properly yeah. on a surface level. Yeah. You know, so love more and you can change. You're a perfect example of someone who was never given how to learn how to survive or yeah. how to love or how to anything and like change and come and grow from a place of love. Yeah. So love more. Yeah. You know, I had this thought and I'll end it on this about, you know, obviously different besides just clients and people, I don't have a lot of clients who are, um, for Trump. I have a few, um, but I would love to bring someone on who would of the opposite, right? Not the liberal point of view for right. me. Right. But of the, uh, and sort of bridge the gap right there. Right. Like, Okay, so that's what you believe. Why is that? Like, understand. Try to like understand. And don't get me wrong. Jesus loves Trump. I do not. I do. <laughs> Jesus loved. Lo <laughs> Jesus is wearing a MAGA hat. I'm kidding. He's not. He's not. Please don't get that. Right. You know, I have to learn now that because you know shit just comes out of my mouth. Same right. with you, and I'm just like, oh, I'm just joking, but like, oh my god, I'm live in front of a lot of people right. now. So like, I'm allegedly, and I'm sorry if I insulted anyone. I feel like I need to instantly start out with allegedly. This is the Hair Healer podcast. This is the Hair Healer podcast. Allegedly, <laughs> here we go. Yeah. But anyway, let me end this up. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you for everyone who tuned in the whole way to the end. <laughs> Ken Orr. And you'll know the three questions. <laughs> you'll know the three questions when you're on here. Um, if anyone, I know he's very open. If anyone wants to reach out to Ken or you can look him up on my um, Instagram. I'm at the Hair Healer 1111 and he's Ken Orr yes. on there. And he has it is always there to help someone struggling with addiction or very other suicide, anything. He's yeah. always there for lending ear. Um, so please feel free to reach out to him on there. And if you would also very similar would like to reach out to me or have me ask him anything, you can email me at thehairhealer1111 at yahoo.com. Please subscribe. Send this to anyone who might like this. Rate, review. And I hope everyone has a fabulous week. I hope this finds you in a good mindset. And I love you all. Bye. Mm -hmm.